The Crypto Markets Update is brought to you by KuCoin, the best place to find the next crypto gem. Today, we have brand new inflation numbers coming in at 8.3%. That's still pretty high, although I guess some would say it could be worse or that it's peaked. Uh, Joining us to discuss the crypto markets is Mark Ostwald, Chief Economist and Global Strategist at ADM Investor Services International. Hi, Mark. Hi. Okay, let's start with the inflation numbers. Um, So Bitcoin, despite being a world famous inflation hedge, reacted immediately by falling, which is somewhat counterintuitive. But again, these are just, you know, short term reactions. What's your outlook? You know, a lot of the crypto market and, you know, the larger stock market seem to be driven recently both by concerns over inflation and rising interest rates. What do you see happening in the near future? Well, I think the the key thing with today's data was uh, above all the fact that the core CPI measure uh, came in well above expectations, 0.6% month on month, 6.2% year on year. That leaves it an annual, a three month annualized rate of 5.6. And the problem with that is people had hoped that that was going to slow to below 5%. And instead, we've got a situation where it's actually accelerating. That, in turn, basically means that the people who earlier in this week had been hoping that actually the, the or refocusing the market, you saw it above all the happening in U.S. Treasuries, where the market suddenly moved away from, is the Fed going to have to do more? Is it behind the curve? Is it going to have to be more aggressive, which we were running scared of, particularly last week, to a situation where people were saying, well, actually, our concern really now is that the economy is going to slow so much that, uh, and the inflation numbers will start coming down, uh, that the Fed actually may not be as aggressive as we'd thought. Um, so we started to factor that into the Treasury market, which saw yields start to come down, give a bit of a boost to risk assets in general. Um, and then we get this number today, which suddenly spiked up uh, above all the U.S. two-year yield um, to, you know, above – about 10, 11 basis points. The key point here is we've got a sort of basically hugely defensive asset, which gives you a yield of 2.6%. And instead of before, where people will say, oh, well, I'm going to get a bit of defensive, and they probably sit on you know a, a T-bill or a, a short-dated treasury uh, uh, for up to 48 hours, and they then say, but my returns are so appalling. And if I turn around to the investors and say, you know, I'm generating 0.25% or even worse, uh, they, they, they're probably all going to say, I can do that. Now we're in a situation where people can actually look at these def- uh, these super defensive assets with low volatility in them and say, you know what, I really don't know what to make all of this. And I can just sit back a little bit and I'm going to take my time. And you can sit on that position for a good deal longer now that it's generating that sort of return. So that's really what the trigger, you know, that's really where we've swung the pendulum back to where we were to a certain extent last week um, in terms of that fear of the Fed having to do more, being behind the curve and therefore creating a fairly adverse environment for risk assets. And we are in this situation, and we've seen it in a in, in number of areas, where you know, because the market's so thin in terms of liquidity support, and you know, it gets thinner the, 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 if you go down the credit scales, if you go down the equity markets, to the lower capitalized, the, you know, particularly non-profitable uh, tech sector type companies, you know, suddenly the support is not there, particularly when you get a jarring sort of event like this. Is the market reaction Mark, overstated? I, I, I guess so, yes. Um, so we've talked a lot and there's been a lot of media about these two big economic factors. One is inflation and the other is interest rates. But there's another aspect that's not being talked about very much at all, and that's China, right? Um, the impact of China on the global market. Now, Shanghai has been basically in lockdown for over 40 days, and there's all sorts of supply chain shocks going on. Can you talk a little bit about what the if China is playing a role in this and, and what it, that might be? Oh, yes. I mean, China is definitely playing in a, ro- a role in this. And the, the importance of China is when we look at it, you, the U.S. may be the largest world economy, but in terms of the growth of the globe, the world economy, China is absolutely critical. And what it's doing at the moment with 
what we might call perma lockdowns. And, you know, even in the situation in Shanghai, where basically they were given the all clear in half of half of Shanghai, they're still not easing up. And that's creating an, the, an eco- the economy to you know, slow quite dramatically. And that's really where the big concern is that the, the, the growth outlook for the global economy um, and the demand is, is just not going to be there. And that we're also in a situation where some, whereby China supplies a lot of the stuff that we buy as consumers and indeed as businesses. And the supply is not going to be there, and therefore that's going to create even more inflation. And so we're in this sort of adverse environment where more inflation means more Fed rate hikes or the risk of more Fed rate hikes, ECB rate hikes, um, and generally an adverse environment for risk appetite. Yeah, if there is this situation where there is a slowdown in China, and for the time being it feels like uh, U.S., uh, U.S. recovery or, U- or U.S. demand is is still uh, where it, where it was before uh, the lockdown. Do you think that ultimately, uh, you know, how does the, how does the Fed play this? Uh, you know, they've they've been playing around in the in the Fed funds rate, but they have also announced quantitative uh, tightening. Do you think that we'll see actually more QT that they might up the amount of of Treasuries they sell uh, from its balance sheet? First of all, to to unlever their situation, but also uh, to to sort of sop up some of that extra cash that's been flowing around and maybe softening U.S. demand a little bit so that it can uh, match what's happening around the globe? Um, I don't think necessarily they'll go down that route, but I mean, uh, but simply because they are more than well aware that as they would start to withdraw liquidity, and we should remember they're only actually starting in June, it feels like they've withdrawn a lot of liquidity and we are anticipating it, but thus far they haven't done it. And they're going to do it at a fairly fast pace. I, I think the, the the big risk here and the thing that people really need to focus on is this inherent volatility we've got as people refinance positions in any market that you care to think of uh, at higher interest rates where the availability is going to be that much less uh, because of the market volatility uh, and the volatility is in pretty much every asset class writ large. Um, the, the biggest problem the Fed has is it's basically, and this is, applies actually to all the central banks, they're trying to control inflation with a demand side in, instrument, i.e. basically the only way that they The only instrument they've got is to raise rates and try and destroy demand. The problem is this is a supply side problem and it's a long standing supply side problem, which we didn't really pay too much attention to. And now we're coming. Chickens are coming home to roost. The most easy example of this is the whole refining capacity in the US is, you know, and actually globally is insufficient for oil, for for crude oil and all the oil products. And we're coming across this and people go, well, you know, just build more. Well, yes, you know, okay, we can build more refineries and they'll come on stream in two, three years time. Um, doesn't solve the the inflation problem. And that's really the nub of the issue. How much can they push back on demand uh, and at the same time also fail to curb what are supply side driven inflation pressures um, before people go, well, yeah, why isn't this working? So there's a, there's a big risk of a credibility problem emerging, um, which I don't think should be underestimated. And that credibility problem then undermines confidence above all in riskier assets. Yeah, uh, bubbles and riskier assets. Well, you know, the Fed has long warned about a run on stable coins should things get a little too frothy. And we do see that with the implosion of the Terra Luna ecosystem. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on the Fed's warnings on that and the broader impact on the crypto markets? Well, yeah, I mean, the Fed's financial stability report, was a, there was a warning on that, and there was a warning also on that it doesn't actually understand how commodity markets work, and that's sort of even more worrying because, uh, <clears throat> you know, they are worried about, more worried about systemic risk, and I think, you know, this is really where the... the where the the whole issue is going to come down to, you are going to get people who are going to, who have lost, particularly in in Terra Luna, um, you know, people have lost money who are going to say, well, why won't we better protect it? 
Um, but heavier regulation is sort of somewhat antithetical to a lot of um, the crypto markets. And, and that's really where this sort of danger lies of where do you put this fine balancing act between creating a sustainable market and, on the other hand, um, creating unsustainable instruments? You know, really, it's not that difficult to do all the structured po products in the credit markets. It's the same sort of thing. People come up with something, it sounds great, and then someone looks at, well, what happens if we get to the 95th or 5th um, <clears throat> percentile tail, tail risk, and then suddenly you know, there is no underlying support. The asset value suddenly evaporates in, you know, because it goes into meltdown, and it's the same problem that we've always had. It's no different for crypto assets than it was for all sorts of structured products that you get in it, you know, in equity and bond markets.